Hello, Lady Pelvic of Pelvic Gaming, and happy super late New Year! Hope y'all are doing good, feeling fine, because I am here today to bring you my first review of 2022 of Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age. Y'all hounded me to play this one. Special thanks to Totensua for gifting me this game two years ago for my birthday. I know, I know. Quick history of Dragon Quest and I, my first was 5 on the DS, then I played 8, 9, and now 11, and from what I've gathered, Dragon Quest is a pretty cushy JRPG. We have this happy kingdom, the good people want for nothing, while something wanders its merry streets. Seemingly out of the blue, a storm brews over the kingdom. Inside the royal walls, a council of elders hold a colloquy, centering around the mark. Meanwhile, a mother holds her marked child, looking out into the storm when suddenly monsters attack, and she is forced to flee with her babe and another child. Unfortunately, they are torn apart, and the babe is sent down a river. After the storm, the baby is taken by a loving old man who raises him, or rather, you. Fast forward to the day you become a man and climb Mount Tor with your childhood friend. You do so, but are met with opposition. A miracle happens, a flash of lightning banishes the beast. News reaches your mom and she reveals to you that you are the reincarnation of the Luminary and destined for greatness. Your first mission is to go visit the King of Heliodor, King Carnelian, and present him with a necklace. Then all would become clear. You do just that and suddenly you're dubbed the Dark One. You are seized and put into the slammer. You make a swift escape with a shady new friend and try to figure out what the hell's going on, as the Luminary is supposed to slay the Dark One, not be it. As you gather information and new people join your cause, it's discovered the gang needs a magic branch to locate six orbs that will lead the Luminary to Yggdrasil. What awaits him there will give him the power to overthrow whatever darkness is lurking. It's a very straightforward story, and this is why Dragon Quest is very cozy. It doesn't particularly do anything new or different. Collect six MacGuffins, destroy darkness, yada yada. Like the Dragon Quest before it, it's very episodic. Each town has a unique problem, once solved, will open a path to the next areas. It's sad to say I didn't care for a chunk of the arcs. I never felt fully invested in a lot of these fairy tales. It certainly wasn't devoid of Dragon Quest charm, it just never hit the same way previous DQ games did. My personal favorite tales are The Mermaid, The Mural, Turning Things Into Gold, and the post-game story that expands on two best friends. Now, I'm a character-driven person, and the cast of Dragon Quest was fine. From my experience, there's always a few good peeps in the party. The hero, which is by far the worst. Why? Silent protagonist. So many times I have been talked about, and I'm the freaking luminary, and somehow I feel like I have the least input. And he's not very expressive either. Then we have Eric, a shady thief, probably my second favorite character. Then Veronica and Serena, who I hate. Veronica is just bitchy and Serena is the trope perfect woman. Sweet, gentle, caring, blah blah blah. Sylvando, the jester and fan favorite. I feel like his personality was so big that others just seem so mild-mannered in comparison. He's very vocal, outgoing, hell, he even has a ship. Jade, a kick-ass monk, and easily the best girl. Rab, an old man, and the backup sage. And there's another to chat about in the spoiler section and post-game goodness. Please skip to this number right here if you're not interested in Act 3, aka post-game. We are going to be talking major spoilers, so 3, 2, 1, spoilers. Act 3 is all about saving the world correctly. Saving the world without Veronica having to sacrifice herself, saving the world through time travel. Already, that put a sour taste in my mouth. Personally, I didn't give a fuck about Veronica, so knowing a large region I was doing this was to bring her back did not enthuse me. Also, it's a fuck ton of backtracking, as a new threat has taken hold of the land. So, the areas you once visited are faced with a different sort of problem, and have you battling harder versions of old bosses. There is so much new content, and a lot of side quests open up. Various challenges, grinding for the best equipment, but my favorite part that makes Act 3 so worth it is seeing how characters' stories change and are wrapped up. This brings me to my favorite character, Sir Hendrik, a noble knight who crosses swords with his best friend who caves to darkness. This is probably my favorite part in the game. Also, I tend to hate time travel because it gets a tad bit confusing. And most importantly, it undoes a lot of character growth and gives another shot at making everything perfect and squeaky clean. Serena in particular was robbed of all development. I'm not even a Serena stan and I was disappointed by what Unraveling Time did to her. I get you can argue, well it still happened in an alternate timeline, now we get two variations of our characters, 
but knowing the characters you're now traveling with has lost all that hard work, experience, and solo growth, it's a little sad to see. Act 3, at its core, is Act 2, but hard mode. Admittedly, I was getting burned out at this point. I thought I wasn't going to do any heavy item grinded, but damn it, I did. I wanted to look cool, so I visited all the towns and did most of their new side quests just to say I did it. Dragon Quest is known for sticking to what works. Don't fix what isn't broken. Dragon Quest XI follows suit, keeping things nice and traditional. It's turn-based with your basic options, attack, defense, spells, abilities, item, yada yada. These are pretty self-explanatory. The only two that may garner some confusions are abilities versus spells. Both consume magic points or MP, but players have more of a say on what abilities they gain, whereas spells are usually level-based and learned automatically. After every battle, you earn experience and gold. And if you level up, you're awarded skill points, which you can use to build your character. You can make them do more damage with specific weapons, learn new abilities and spells. And don't worry, you can always redo your pathing if you make a mistake. Certain stones are pieces for pet power, AKA the team attack. Certain abilities unlock different pet powers that do various things, grant buffs, guarantees rare drops, or does a stupid amount of damage. Or you could just stay in pep mode, which increases different stats based on the character. Two of my absolute favorite things about combat is you could switch your lineup without any penalty. And auto battling. Dragon Quest knows it can be a grind fest, and this is by far the easiest of the titles. You could set your party up to do auto battle and get through the pesky grind. But be warned, I played on normal and it's pretty damn easy. Sometimes I'd set characters to auto battle bosses and still won. And the AI is pretty smart. If a boss is susceptible to a status ailment, they'll expose it. Even things outside of combat are relatively simple. When arriving at a new area, look for a pink dot on your map for a person who will guide you on what to do next. Purple bubbles are for side quests, which usually are pretty decent this time around. There were a few ones I hated, like kill this enemy with a specific pet power, but most were collect this or forge that. Speaking of, Dragon Quest is known to have an alchemizing mechanic. Here we have the fun size Forge, which is an enjoyable minigame to craft the best equipment. And even if you mess up, there are perfectionist pearls that will allow you to give your piece another go. The Forge can be accessed anywhere or directly while camping. Camping is super nice, you get to see all your parties sitting around the fire, relaxing and thinking about the road ahead. There are special side quests called Tickington Quests. These are unlocked by finding tuckles throughout the land. They'll give you a past word that will unlock an area in each respective Dragon Quest book. Each book represents a different Dragon Quest, where you help the heroes and notable NPCs of that game. It was such a great way to implement fan service. I know, I enjoyed going into the world of Dragon Quest 5 and 8 to see certain characters again or revisit my favorite places. Even hearing a chiptune version of a specific track. I really enjoyed the Tickington side quest and it kind of made me interested in I think Dragon Quest 7? 6? I like the Pegasus Tower and the Rainbow Gem Mines. Exploration is made easy, Zoom being a spell that fast travels you to any town, and you get a horse relatively quickly for traversing these large areas. What really stepped up Dragon Quest XI's exploration game is by adding monster mounts. Slay a sparkly monster and you can ride them, using their different abilities to traverse the land to areas you otherwise couldn't get to. Flying is without a doubt my favorite. You'll be using these creatures to explore outside areas or indoors. Which brings me to dungeons, they're so much better for one reason. They now have save points. I remember playing Dragon Quest for the first time and stumbling in on a boss without a save point. And I'd win, but whew, the stakes felt high. Even if you don't get a game over screen, rather you reawaken at the church and half your gold is taken. Plus, the save points heal you. I didn't mind any of the dungeons except for the cryptic crypt. That was my least favorite dungeon ever. Oh my god, like I hate it so. And before I move to the graphics and music, I just want to say the definitive edition added so much. I'm not going to go through it all here, but some of the big ones are calling your horse anywhere on the map. At the forge, you can buy missing items right then and there. Granted, rare items you would have to forage for yourself. But this was an absolute game changer. Every JRPG should have that. Tickington quests are unlocked differently. New mountable monsters, new outfits, adjustable battle speed, and I mean, there's just so much. If you'd like to see why you should play the definitive edition, I've left a link in the description detailing all the version differences. Now I gotta say, when you first boot up Dragon Quest XI and you see the CGI opening, oh, I was floored. I did not know Dragon Quest could ever look this beautiful. It was really impressive and somehow kept its cartoony style with a smidge of realism. 
Dragon Quest XI is without a doubt the most beautiful in the series, the characters, the various environments, even the enemies. One of the most impressive things is Dragon Quest XI can be played in 3D or 2D. They had to make the game twice, twice, which is insane, plus the 3DS version. And yes, you could switch between 3D and 2D, but you'll have to restart the chapter. Dungeons are reworked to better complement the new look. And I didn't dabble too much in 2D, I mostly stuck to Tickington, which is all in 2D. And I really appreciate that even costume changes would show up in the 2D realm. They didn't have to go that hard, but I'm glad they did. Now if you don't know, Dragon Quest XI came out on PS4 Switch, and in Japan, on the 3DS. Obviously, the 3DS doesn't look as crisp as the other two, but it does have that Dragon Quest cartoony charm. Personally, even if the 3DS was an option for me, I would have stuck to the Nintendo Switch or PlayStation. There's some subtle details missing in the shading and shrubbery in the Switch version, but nothing that takes away from the game. Lastly, to touch up on enemies, yes, it does do the recoloring of skins bit like every JRPG ever, but enemy animations are hilarious. Whether they're first coming into battle or their death animation. One of, if not the best things about the Dragon Quest series are the enemies and seeing how animated they are. I'd say I've been pretty vocal that Dragon Quest has subpar music. It's my second least favorite soundtrack next to the Tales of series. Dragon Quest XI soundtrack is fine. It does have a pretty good mix of sad and upbeat, and yet I don't see myself gushing over it, and it's pretty repetitive. Also, the S version has an orchestrated version of the soundtrack, which I simply prefer because it's what I'm used to. I think what I appreciated most is the entire soundtrack is a celebration of past Dragon Quest titles. Imagine my happiness when I heard the Saber Cat theme from Dragon Quest VIII. Plus, when you enter Tickington and you go through the various DQ universes, you hear chiptune remixes of the original songs, and that was a super amazing touch. Now my favorite track, I think has to be Ole Silvando. You hear it during his parade or wherever his boys go. It's just good vibes and it perfectly captures Silvando's fun personality. Dragon Quest XI is a good game and I understand why people love it so much. At the same time, I also understand why people got bored of it so quickly. For me personally, I enjoyed it, I just felt it overstayed its welcome. For me, it's my third favorite Dragon Quest as 5 and 8 still reign supreme. It's weird, I think 11 was too cozy for me. It just felt too... samey. I understand how people got bored of it because I felt bored sometimes myself. A common thing I heard was, it's like Dragon Quest 8 but better. And obviously that's subjective, and I liked the mini fairy tales of 8 more than I did Dragon Quest 11. I don't know if it's because I played 8 sooner and 8 was one of my first Dragon Quests and 11 now I'm just kind of used to the Dragon Quest formula, or if 8's truly greater. For me 11 just lacked that magic, that mysticism, that humor that Dragon Quest 8 just perfected. Of course, I would never say that Dragon Quest XI was void of those things. It certainly had its happy, fun moments, and really emotional ones. Another thing I can't believe I'm frankly complaining about is the length. I didn't think Act 3 needed to go that hard. It was really long and redundant. I guess if you loved the game, then more Dragon Quest XI must have been a wonderful thing. But by the time I was done, I was exhausted. Like, I was happy to put it down versus, oh, I just want to spend so much more time in this world. Like, no, nah, I was done. Bye. See ya never. For me, I was not in love with the world and characters to want to be there an extra 20 hours for Act 3. It really did take its toll on me. Like, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. There was some fun tied into it, but I didn't need another 20 hours. Not to mention, gone is the character development. Some of you may be thinking, based on how I'm talking about this game very nonchalantly, you're wondering, did I really like it? And I do. I'm just not as in love with it as everyone else is. I would recommend Dragon Quest XI if you want something familiar and lighthearted. And also, you have the time. 
100 plus hours of time. And of course I didn't forget, it's Black History Month, the tail end, but I still made it. I am always on the lookout for top quality products from black family owned businesses. I like to find them and pass them along to you guys. When it comes to hair products, I specifically look for black owned businesses because, well, they have hair like mine and they know what they're doing. I would like to introduce you to Adua Beauty. No, this isn't sponsored, they probably don't even know I'm doing this, and yes, I bought these with my own money. So I've been using their Bow Mint collection for months and my hair is in dire need of moisture all the time. This has been my go-to. They also have my favorite leave-in conditioner. My hair just instantly becomes smooth once I rub that bad boy in there. Also, I got some of their Blue Tansy collection, but I haven't tried it yet, but it goes to show you how much I love this brand. So if you're looking for some new luxury products to try, want to support a black owned business, please check out Adua Beauty. Thank you so much for watching, I'm back baby, working on content, playing my first ever Shin Megami Tensei game, Nocturne, that will be the next review, so look forward to that, and if you like what I do, consider becoming a patron, join the discord, get postcards, early access, all that good stuff. Happy Black History Month, and I'll see you in the next video. Mwah!